So I'm glad you're here. I hope you get comfortable and settled in to, to real life stuff and real life struggle because what we're going to see here in this Bible study here, we're going we're gonna to take a look at uh, maybe four verses, maybe the whole chapter, I'm not sure. It's, uh, uh, you know, there's, there's eight verses in chapter 15, not too many. Um, but I put a title on tonight's message, The Time Has Come. And indeed, the time has come for us to start this study. And so um, as, we, as we look into this chapter, I want us to remember some of the things that uh, we have been migrating across as we've been moving through uh, the book of Revelation. We know and we've learned, and it's been underscored in more recent days, that uh, the scene, the landscape across Revelation as we move through these chapters, that most of the chapters are not chronological in nature. Uh, that we're getting a scene here, and then we move on, and then we get a little more magnification of the scene and all that stuff. Um, and, 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 and we've also been reminded here with Revelation that, that the church has not been given these things to satisfy our curiosity and to the stuff that will take place once the church is gone. It's not why we have the book of Revelation. God has given us this so that we can understand that his faithfulness from days past to the present hour, and to what lies ahead, that his faithfulness will reign through. It will shine through, regardless of what we, you and I, whatever we experience in the minute-by-minute or the day-by-day thing. Because sometimes we can get into those spots. It's like, Lord, where's your faithfulness? Your word says this, your word says that. And emotionally, we can get to a place. It's like, ah, you know, we, we, we get scared or we wig out or we uh, you know, we, we fall to that place of weakness of faith, if you will, and we begin to doubt God and all that. Those are all the real things that are attached to our humanity. And so for, for you know, gathering together, like, like a time like Wednesday night or Sunday, or, or, you know, maybe you have a small group that you get attached to, or, or getting into your own personal Bible study, right? Staying close. Jesus would tell us in John 15 to abide in his word and his word within us. You know, uh, Paul tells us that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word. We are always reminding ourselves of the promises and the things of God, about God, and, and what he's done for us. We're always reminding ourselves of those things because, you know, it, it just seems like that we just have a short memory. And, you know, reading through the Bible on a yearly basis, <clears throat> you know, this helps us to keep these things there. But for me, I struggle because I'm, you know, right now I'm in the Old Testament. I just finished Deuteronomy today. I'll start Joshua tomorrow. But, but as I spend so much time, you know, reading through the the Bible, I do it, uh, you know, book by book. I go Genesis to Revelation every year. I just kind of read it that way. I'm not in, I'm not, I don't have my time split between Old and New Testament. Maybe I should. Uh, but, but, but sometimes you can get in those portions of just reading your Bible, and it's like, oh, man, I'm just slugging down in the mud, and I need those fresh promises uh, of remembering the New Testament side specifically. And so, anyways, <clears throat> As, we have, uh, as we've come here through 14, and, and even as we dive here into chapter 15, uh, we're finding that there's more angelic activity that is ticking up across the face of the earth, uh, and, and, and God is preparing us for that big chapter, chapter 16, when these final judgments, he pours out in rapid succession, the bold judgments, all seven of them, bam, he takes care of that, and then, and then we find the return, the second coming of Christ. Now, I wish it was all... Uh, compiled and synchronized in such a short capacity like that is not. Chapter 15 and chapter 16, for those of you that like uh, the chronological events, this is linear in nature. These, these chapters can go, uh, you know, and just walk us through the events, but then it stops, and then we don't find any more chronological stuff until we get to about chapter 19 or so when it fills in the gaps uh, right here at the end of chapter 16. And so uh, what did we learn last week? Well, we learned last week about the description of the crop of the earth, that it was ripe, and as we studied through and, and we unpackaged some of those, uh, the Greek language that is there, we found the flavor that it literally meant that the, that the earth is overripe for reaping, for judgment. It's overripe. That, that, that God's goodness has gone so far that the condition, it's described in a crop there in chapter 14, the first side of it, uh, that, that the condition has gotten so overripe that the crop is like starting to die now. It's, so it's overripe for judgment. Uh, the second side of what we learned about is, is down where the grapes were at, um, and that was is that the, the grapes of the earth are ripe for judgment. Now, it's a different picture in that one. This one is, is all about the wine press. This is all about, you know, you get a big, big juicy grape, right? The, the skin is so tight and it's so, it's so just plump. 
that like the ends are splitting on it. That's the picture of the second one. And so all of that to say, as we learned last week, that the earth is ripe for judgment. And so we came away with that. Uh, And then we also got to to string together a few of the uh, different chapters as it pertains to the Battle of Armageddon. And and, and we worked our way through through that vision, uh, Revelation 14, verses 14 through 20, and we saw ahead to Armageddon. And and, and we covered, you know, uh, a, a few points along the way. But as we get here now to Revelation 15, what happens is, is that that battle, right, you know, right at the, uh, you know, at the end of, of Armageddon, the second coming of Christ, well, we circle back here in chapter 15, and, and we move to this place to where uh, God begins to describe more in detail, where he gives to John more in detail about what's going on in heaven, about the preparations that are happening here for these bold judgments, and what's about to take place. And so that's where chapter 15 is. It circles back. And, and, and once and again, as it pertains to the chronological nature, the linear nature, 15 and 16, they're going to go very easy next to each other. Uh, and then it'll skip ahead to chapter 19, and we won't get more of that chronological stuff until we're in chapter 19. And so uh, we're covering these last plagues on the scene. And I want you to take a look at it in your Bible, Revelation 15 and 1. Here's what he says. He says, then I, this is John, I saw in heaven another marvelous event of of great significance. Seven angels were holding the seven last plagues, which would bring God's wrath to completion. We'll stop right there. This chapter, while it only has eight verses, it is divided up into two main flows. The first flow, verses one through four. Very simple. This focuses on victory in heaven, and we're gonna, we'll, we'll unfold this one pretty good here. Uh, but man, this first half is all about victory in heaven, and, and, and the beauty that is attached behind this thing is, uh, quite honestly, it's, it's pretty encouraging. So, so I hope you find yourself encouraged as you go away. Um, but the second half of this thing, verses five through eight, the final four verses here in this thing, uh, this is, is where that focus again is, it's pointing towards what the angels have, have gotten from the Lord, Okay, and, and what they're sent out to do. And this is focusing on the distribution of God's final vengeance with those seven last bold judgments at the very end of the great tribulation period. And in, in, in again, right around that time of the battle of Armageddon and just prior to the return of uh, Christ's second coming. So it, it's focusing ahead on all that. Uh, for us tonight, we're only gonna have two ideas to take away. The first idea is just understand the significance. So in these first four things that are laid out here, in these first four verses, let us just understand the significance, okay? Um, John calls out here. Uh, he says, there, he saw in heaven another marvelous event of great significance. I should tell you that I'm reading from the New Living Translation tonight. Uh, I normally teach from uh, the New King James uh, when it comes to Revelation, but tonight I'm reading from NLT. And, and, and what he is calling the attention to is the third time about a great significance, a, a, a great event that is happening that is worthy of us paying attention. It was something that captured his attention and something that he penned. And so in the prophetic view of the tribulation period, we have to grasp the big picture so that we can get the flows of the movements of what's going on. The book of Revelation becomes intimidating when we just when we don't understand that there's there's a movement that God is taking us through. Uh, again, prophetic writings paint the big scene, the big picture, and, and and whether it's Old Testament or here in the New Testament with Revelation, it's not all given in a linear capacity, and that often leads to the confusion of reading a book of the Bible, a book of prophecy that looks like that because it's forward looking. And, and, and we get confused in that. And so with, with what John is sharing here about another marvelous event that has great significance here, he's, again, he's just laying out the movement of what is, is going on. And, and we need to understand this. Okay, so let's do a little Bible Olympics. Take your Bible and go back up, back up to chapter 12. Revelation chapter 12, verse number one. Okay, here's the three significant movements of what he's laying out for this tribulation period. That's it. And he's just underscoring this, okay? First one, Revelation 12 and 1, he says this. This is John still. He says, Then I witnessed in heaven an event of great significance. Now, this is the very first one. 
He says, I saw a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon beneath her feet, and a crown of 12 stars on her head. She was pregnant, and she cried out because of her labor pains and the agony of giving birth. Now, when we were at chapter 12, we unfolded this thing at great length, and we walked together, and I taught you a number of things about how to, uh, in, 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 you know, to use the Bible to interpret the Bible, whatever the text is. You know, we talked about that 2020 rule. You know, we want to go 20 verses before and 20 verses after. We want to use the law of first mention. We want to understand that when we come across a particular Bible text, God has not made this so that, that his church can't understand it. He has provided that. He's given us the Holy Spirit. He's given us the, the light of his word. And we may have to examine different passages of scripture so that we can understand what's going on in the moment. And in Revelation 12, we unfolded this at great length. If you're, if you're super curious about the details of it, pull up the study. And, and my, my handwritten, or not my handwritten notes, but my type notes are there, and, and you'll get a wonderful view of this. Simply put for tonight, realizing this significant event, this is the nation of Israel. That's all he's talking about. Now, he does use some descriptive things that can, like, it can, it can move us into this vein to this, like, well, man, oh, what does this mean? I got to spiritualize this, and oh, and, and we, we start putting things on top of this. Well, the only thing we need to put on top of it is an understanding of God's word. So he, when he talks about being clothed with the sun, you know, what is this all about? You know, Isaiah 43 and 10, it tells us, you know, uh, God speaking to Israel that, that, that they are his witness, says the Lord. And so this clothed with the sun, we, we realize that it was nothing more than an, an exalted status, if you will. God's chosen people, Israel. And, and, and that helped us to identify. You know, scholars give, you know, three different interpretations of what this looks like. The most popular one is that of the nation Israel. And so we saw that. You know, we also saw the, the moon under her feet. You know, and, and when we explored this at the time, we went all the way back to the very beginning, Genesis chapter 12 and 2. And, and, and we learned the promise that God gave to Abraham, and that was that I will make you a great nation. I will bless you. And we realized that there was a covenant relationship in place, again, pointing to nothing more than the nation of Israel. And then the final thing that we saw uh, in uh, uh, Revelation 12 and 1 there, when we were at this and we were examining it, was that on her head was a crown with 12 stars. Okay, well, we unpackaged that too, and we realized that it consisted of nothing more than 12 tribes. I know I'm flying through that rather, rather rapidly here tonight. It's because we've already covered it, but that's just a little fly over there on a couple points around that. And so the significance of the event as it's in the tribulation period, just understand that John is just calling out the nation Israel. That's it. Now let's move on to the second one, okay? Second significant event also in Revelation 12 and 3. Take a look at the verse. John says, Then I, I, I witness in heaven another significant event. He says, I, I, I saw a large red dragon with seven heads and ten horns with seven crowns on his head. His tail swept away one third of the stars in the sky and he threw them to the earth. He stood in front of the woman as she was about to give birth, ready to devour her baby as soon as it was born. And we'll stop right there. Um, the idea in this, what is it? Well, you know, John is, is going through and he's using all this symbolism, but we realize that this was nothing more than the final world empire under Satan's control. We saw that. And, and, and these descriptive words, the symbolism that is used, the fiery red stuff, as, as we unpackaged the text when we were there, we learned that it was, it was describing the viciousness of which Satan and, uh, uh, you know, the soon-to-be Antichrist and the false prophet and all that stuff, the viciousness of what is attached there and the bloodshed that would arise and all that. We saw that the ten horns, and, and what we learned from that was it was a political rule and authority. And as we opened up Daniel chapter 7, we connected all those pieces when we were in Revelation 12. And then we saw the seven heads and the seven diadems. Well, what is that all about? Very simple. It's the seven rulers of nations. It's, it's, it's a global society and the different rulers that are attached. Again, we use Daniel 7, and, and we unpackage those things at large. What does it mean to us tonight? Just understand that the three segments or the three great significant events of what John is calling out, first is the nation of Israel, second is this final world empire under Satan's control, and now we move on to the third one back in Revelation 15, okay? Okay. We're just, we're just setting the stage with the significance of the events. Revelation 15 and 1, one more time. John again, 
he saw in heaven another marvelous event of great significance. That's the third one. Two in chapter 12, one right here. It's the third event. Now, this particular event, this, this brings divine judgment upon the satanic system and all the political power of the beast, okay? Uh, you know, the stuff under the Antichrist and all that was going on. And, and, and this is that significant event. So what John is giving to us on this flyover is just three pillars so we can understand that in the, in, in the big scope of the tribulation period, that, that here are the things that we're examining. That's all he's given us. And, and, and when, when we reduce it down to the simplistic like that, hopefully it's so much easier to digest because, again, the flow is going back and forth. There's a scene that's on the place, and then the curtains come close. And then the curtains open up, and it's like, we're in another scene. It's like, what the heck just happened? <laughs> Where do we go? You know, and, and, and just understand that that is the nature of prophetic writings. It's a big picture, but when we string the big picture together, we can see what this stuff looks like. And so, what does God do? Well, there's something pretty important here in verse number one. Because after this significant event, we see that there's, after John writes this, he describes, he says that there is seven angels were holding seven last plagues, which would bring God's wrath to completion. Key word there is completion. This is the word, uh, it's spelled T-E-L-E-O, and it's pronounced teleo. Okay, it's a Greek word. Uh, all it means is uh, fulfilled or finished. Something, um, it's not fancy, but it's very distinctive. And in what John is saying, in this last portion, in these last events here, is what God is going to do. He's going to finish the work. He's going to be faithful to what he said he would do. Jesus said that vengeance is his and that he would repay. You will also remember this, and they'll, they'll throw this cross-reference on the screen here, uh, out of the Gospel of John, John 19 and 30, New Living Translation, that in this particular verse, we see, we get a picture of Jesus on the cross. And from the cross, Jesus cries out this same exact word right here, teleo, it's finished. And so notice with me, that the first coming of Christ, when it, when it pertained to that redemption price and paying, you know, and paying the price for our sin, okay, he said this, John 19 and 30, from the cross, it's finished. This is the first coming. Now as we get here to looking forward to that, the second coming of Christ, okay, at the end of the tribulation period, after all these bold judgments come out and all this stuff, the, the word is coming out of the holy of holies, that God is giving the word, he's dispatching the angel, angels with the final seven bowl judgments. And, 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 and what John is giving us, again, is just this snapshot here, very simple, that judgment is finished, it's done. This is it, 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 it's complete, okay? The judgment of God upon a God-forsaking world will be complete with these seven final bull judgments. That's all he's laying out for us. Now let's think about this for just a second. I, I, I know that any time we gather together, that there's always a variation of people that come into the sanctuary, there's always a variation of people that are watching online and all that. But maybe we've wondered this about our own life. Am I going to make it to heaven? You know, these things can haunt us. These things can plague us because we, we, we live in a culture where it's so performance-driven. And sometimes we can marry the stuff that goes on with the, the, the world and we can drag it right here into our theological beliefs and our understanding of the Bible. And we know that that is off base. It's not. God's a finisher. And, 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 and while Jesus said it is finished on the cross and while John is indicating here that the judgments are finished, they're, they're complete, you should know this, that what God has started within you and me, that he's gonna complete it. Take a look at the screen, Philippians 1 and 6. Paul writes, he says, I am certain that God, who began the good work within you, will continue his work until it is finally finished on the day when Christ Jesus returns. So, so we gotta ask ourselves, Maybe I should just ask you, are you going to make it? The answer is yes. That's right. Good, 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 good. Good word. You're going to make it. Why? Because, because Jesus is a finisher. Not because of you. Because you may not be a finisher. You may start a million things and finish none of them. Well, welcome to your own sinful humanity and weakness and all of that stuff. 
But our God is a finisher. And because of him and because of what he's done, listen, you, your salvation is secure in Christ. But the thing is, it's in Christ, in him. And we have this, and it's beautiful. So now the next thing here, okay? Let's, let's, let's move ahead just a little bit farther here. Let's take a second idea on. And that is, is, is that they passed the test. Take a look at verse number two. He says, I saw before me what seemed to be a glass sea mixed with fire. And on it stood all the people who had been victorious over the beast and his statue and the number representing his name. They were all holding harps that God had given them. And they were singing the songs of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb. Now, does anybody in here know who Tim Hawkins is by chance? Raise your hand so I can see it. So, okay, so it's a Christian comedian guy. What, what does he talk about? He has this little funny phrase he does. You know, he talks about jamming with the lamb, right? Okay, now we see these tribulation saints up there with harps, and they're singing a song to the Lord. They're singing the song of the lamb, of Moses and of the lamb. So what, what we have tribulation saints in heaven. They're just jamming with the lamb. That's all you should know about that right there. Uh, very comical. But they, task, they, they pass the test, okay? And these are the, uh, the martyrs in heaven. Now, this sea of glass, right? We got a sea of glass mixed with fire. I, I, I want you to consider this because we're not going to fully unpackage all of that because we have talked about this stuff back in chapter four. So I, I'm not going to back up too far there. But, but I want you just to consider this, the purifying work that God does within our lives so that the fires of judgment don't destroy us. And what is taking place? Well, we have a picture here where John is reporting to us the scene in heaven. The status in heaven, and in this, this scene that he, he talks about is, is that he's got this sea of glass here that is mixed with fire, and here these tribulation saints are, and they're given harps, and they're singing this song, you know, they're jamming with the lamb, as Tim Hawkins would say. And you and I, we can be thankful, yes, that when God starts to work, he's going to complete it. We can be thankful, although we don't like to go to this chapter and talk about this, we can be thankful about the chastening hand of God. Because when you and I get off course, what does God do? He does that work within us to, you know, to chasten us, to increase that virtue, as, as it would say within Hebrews. That he is doing something so that we do not go to that place of suffer the, the, the judgment of the fires that destroy for all of eternity. So there's something to be said about this. But these tribulation saints... Well, what do we know about them? Well, what we've seen so far and what we're even reading here in this chapter is that they're going to go through the struggle of being in the world system. They're going to be in a world of doom in this time when all of these things from the seals to the vials to right here at the bowls and all of this stuff to all of these things being poured out that, that man, they've seen a world that has been wrecked economically. They've seen a world that has been wrecked uh, in, 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 in the ecology of nature, if you will, from the water to the land. They've, they've seen famine. They've seen war. They've seen all of these things that it, it's been completely devastating on a global basis. Listen, we've been in COVID now for nearly a year, right about a year or so, and, and, and we're whining because of the conditions that we've been in, and they are frustrating, okay? I'm with you on that. High five. We're on the same vein. But what lies ahead is significantly worse than what you and I are going through right now. And these tribulation saints are going to struggle in a world of doom and, and, and the incredible pressure, if you will, that they have to go through to live their lives. It's crazy. But verse 2 gives us some insight. And I don't want you to miss this. And, 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 and maybe you've studied Revelation before. and Maybe you've unpackaged these things before. But I don't want you to miss what he's talking about. Take a look at verse 2. Second sentence in verse 2, he says, and, and, and on it stood all the people who had been victorious over the beast, okay, and his statute and the number representing his name. So three little things, three areas of victory. If you've, if you've got a new King James, it kind of breaks it down a little bit different. It maybe it'll, it'll add like a fourth thing in there. But the idea is it's still compiled around three main things. And these three areas of victory... While this took place with them, or will take place with them, it hasn't happened yet, it will take place with them, you and I are living in the middle of this stuff right now. Right now, March of 2021. Well, what is it, Jeff? Well, the first one is this, is that 
victorious over the beast, okay? So understanding this from the vantage point of political pressure, because who was the beast? He was the Antichrist. He was, the, he was that public figure, if you will, that's on the world stage of leadership. So that public pressure, that political pressure, I should say, is there. And, and, and what is that pressure? Well, it's, it's to concede to social policy and opinion, uh, the opinion of the Antichrist, the policies of the Antichrist, the policies of the one world government. That was the pressure that they were under but they were victorious over the beast. They did not bend to the antichrist policies. Now, if, if, if you think about that along the lines of where we sit today as the church in the climate that we're in within our own country, uh, let alone the global uh, climate, that there is political pressure upon the church. And, and we as a fellowship have not sidestepped those things. We've gone, we've gone squarely into the middle of that stuff and, and, and we've spoken very directly about these things. But I just want you to capture the idea, simple application pull out from this, is nothing more than the tribulation saints because of the faithfulness of God, although they had to go to great pressures and great lengths, and many of them die, true, 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 they made it. They were victorious. They stood upon the promises of God, the faithfulness of God. And you and I can get beyond these political pressures and we can have victory as we stand upon the promises of God. Amen. That we do not concede to the social policy, the social opinion, which quite frankly, it changes in every generation. You know, this, the hot topic is X for right now. And then we get to the next generation and then the hot topic is, is this. Right? And, and, and if you've gone enough times around the tracks, you're going, okay, I see this. It changes with every generation. Yes. So, so surviving the political pressure. Second thing is this. They were, they were victorious over his statue. I love that the NLT interprets it that way because sometimes we can forget about these things. You perhaps remember back into, uh, what is, I, th I think it's the third chapter or so of the book of Daniel, of what happened to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, right? That they were forced by, by, by uh, you know, um, what was going on in Babylon with Nebuchadnezzar, with his staff, with all of his things. And even though that they were the Hebrew children that had been deported from Judah, and now they're here in Babylon, and now they're, they're serving this king, and, and they came in as teenagers and all that stuff, yet they were put into a position to have to bow to that 90-foot statue, like when they heard the harps and the lyres, or, you know, the, the, whatever the musical instruments were, and all that stuff happened. They, they were to hit their face and they were to pay homage to that great statue. So I love that NLT puts this in here like this statue. And so what is this all about? Well, think with me for just a second. This is all about nothing more than the religious pressure that will face them. Because while the Antichrist, he comes in, and he breaks his treaty with the Jews halfway through, right, that three and a half year period. He comes and he sits there within their temple and he declares to them that he must be worshiped as God and all that. We know where we're at in this timeline of having moving through this revelation study. We know that we are at the very, 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 very end of that seven year period. That right here when, the, when these rapid bull judgments come out. So we're in that great tribulation period and all that pressure has happened. That, that, that is something that is, is spilled across the landscape of the world, this religious pressure, the, the false worship, maybe much like what Daniel friends, they had to go through. But these guys, they were victorious. And, and, and I want you to soak this up, okay? Because this is, man, we can learn so much from this right now. They didn't compromise biblical principles by bowing to the latest mainstream objects of submission. You know, the mainstream wants to put us into submission to certain things. And I understand that we've talked about the policies and the political pressure. That's true. But there's a spilling out that happens over the religious pressure as well. Um, I, 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 um, I don't, I'm not prepared. Uh, I don't have a site here on the screen. I normally give you the reference source that I'm citing. Um, but on Monday, uh, there was an article that came out in, in uh, what is it? Christianity Today is, is the publication. I'm not a big reader of that particular thing, but I do get various emails from, from uh, different sources and so forth. And the email that they had, uh, that they distributed there, had to do with uh, Christian abor uh, not abortion, Christian adoption uh, agencies. So the largest Christian adoption place within the United States of America is capitulating to this Equality Act. They're moving to, and, they, and they've removed from their policies that, that, that their defense, you know, that they've held to, I believe it's been for about 75 years, if I'm not mistaken, 
that they have always held to marriage being between a man and a woman. They've just capitulated under this, this public pressure, this religious pressure that is going on, and they've pulled that out of their things, and they've changed their policies here in light of the Equality Act, which hasn't quite, quite honestly, it hasn't passed the Senate yet. And, 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 and they're navigating down a vein that is contrary to where they have stood over the courses of the decades because of the pressure that is upon religious institutions and all of these Christian beliefs and all that. Gang, I want to, I want to tell you this. I want to encourage you in this. I don't want to tell you anything. I want to encourage you. I want to exhort you. Listen, place your faith in Jesus Christ and him and him alone. Stand in his word and his word alone. The times are going to come and they're going to go. The, the, the issues are going to come and they're going to go. Yes, you're going to have to navigate through some pretty radical, gnarly stuff in the current age that we're in. But if you're attached to this fellowship, the reason that we're going through 1 Peter on Sunday is so that you and I can have hope in a hostile world. That you and I can, can, can maintain our Christian bearings and grounding when our world is gone counter-Christ. Maybe I could say gone anti-Christ. <laughs> well, yeah, we could say that, really, because Paul says uh, little a, right? Not big A. Anti, uh, Anti-Christ, big A, we know that's a dude that is satanically charged by Satan, uh, political ruler, but the small a. Paul says that many uh, small a anti-Christ have come, and they're even now on the scene. And so hold fast. Uh, don't give up. Don't give up your pro-life positions don't give up you know, and, and, and fall prey to the sexual revolution. Don't give in to the gender issues. Don't give in to the false narratives of the day. Uh, and for that matter, don't, don't follow conspiracy theories either, okay? Stay away from all of that stuff. If you're a person that focuses on all the crazy stuff that goes on in the news, I, I want to tell you that half of your life is misguided. You just learn what half that is. So <laughs> be careful. Uh, third thing here that we can learn from this, uh, about three areas of victory here. Uh, is the economic pressure. uh, Look again at at the second half of verse two there. Uh, We saw the beast, we saw the statute, and and watch, uh, the number representing his name, okay? Um, You know, at the end of chapter 13, we saw that, the mark of the beast, 666, let him who has wisdom understand what this is all about. And so, so here in this area where it comes to economic pressure, we know that if you haven't bought in and you haven't received the mark of the beast, that you're not paying homage in, 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 in both a political, religious, and an economic way through that mark, that your life is going to be a living hell because you're, you're, you're virtually, you're X'd out of society. Now, while it is not to the same pressure right now, we can understand this. The world is getting a taste of this. And what is it? It's cancel culture. It's all over the place. Now, now hear me out. I'm not equating the two, okay? I'm not saying that cancel culture of 2021 is, is, is the exact like kind of what we find uh, the tribulation saints overcoming here in Revelation 15. I'm not saying that. I'm merely telling you that the trappings, that the tasting, that the fragrances of, of what lies ahead here, it's already spilling out, gang, all over the place. It's already happening right before your eyes. And, 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 and the only ones that don't recognize it are the ones that have done this. Watch. You close your Bible. Well, well what, is, what is this? We quote this and we talk about this, right? We talk about that wonderful passage in Psalm 119. Oh, his word, it's a lamp to my feet. Shows me how to get right with Jesus. Shows me where I stand. Oh, it's a perfect law of liberty. Uh, Paul tells us, 1 Corinthians 11, that I'm to look into the perfect law of liberty to see who I am, to see where I'm at. But it's also a lamp to my feet to, to, to show me where, or light to my path, I should say. Lamp to my feet, light to my path. Lamp, here I am, light, there I go. It shows me where to walk. It shows me how to avoid the potholes. It shows me how to stay out of the weeds. It, it shares with me all of this stuff. And when I understand that God is faithful, past, present, future, by studying the book of Revelation, by learning of, of what lies ahead and seeing even how God deals with those that are in increasingly terrible situation how his faithfulness comes through, then I'm able to stand in a secure way. I'm able to balance out my mind and my emotions. I'm able to balance out what I think and the way I feel and, 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 and the, the certainty of God's word through the power of his Holy Spirit. It stabilizes my feet so that I can walk straight, that I can, that, that I can actually be a man of my word, a woman of my word, a, a person of character, a Christian, a reflection of Jesus. And these guys, they stood through that economic pressure. 
They rejected allegiance to the global economic system. They were victorious over the number that was representing the name of the beast. Amen and awesome. Now, look to your neighbor and say, I want that. Okay. Great. Well, then look at the screen then. Second Timothy, chapter 3, verse 12. Check this out. Did I lose my wingman over there? I think I have. Nope, we're good. Okay, I'm given. I saw nobody sitting at that one particular computer, and I know there's a number of them. I'm going, well, we just lost this. Okay, we're here. Okay, check this out. Second Timothy 3, 12. Yes, and everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus, what's going to happen to them? We'll suffer persecution. But you looked at each other, and you said, I want that. Hmm, okay. Listen, this type of stand that the tribulation saints took, it cost them their life. Can I, can I, can I let you in on a little secret? Okay, Paul told this to Timothy. Okay, if you desire to live godly in Christ, you're gonna suffer persecution. It doesn't mean that all of you or all of us, it doesn't mean that we're all losing our head, okay? It doesn't mean that. For some, perhaps. I, I don't know if you're necessarily in this room, you're, you're watching online. That's what it is. You're going to lose your head out there. Shame, shame. Bad Christian. <laughs> Kidding. It's a joke, okay? So, but there's a cost to taking a stand. And remember, as we have described on Sunday, a couple weeks back on Sunday in our, in our first Peter study, that we talked about what that persecution looks like. It's an animosity towards your view and your position. It's a resistance towards you know, your religious convictions, your beliefs, we, we, we've seen the trappings of that. But Paul says that if you desire to live godly, you're going to suffer persecution. But can we ramp that up a little bit and we can, can we put a little bit more meat on this? Because Jesus said something before Paul ever communicated this to Timothy. In Matthew chapter 16, verse 24 and 27, also on the screen, take a look at this. Here's what he says. Then Jesus said to his disciples, if any of you wants to be my followers, you must turn from your selfish ways Take up your cross and follow me. If you try to hang on to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake, you will save it. And what do you benefit if you gain the whole world but lose your own soul? Is anything worth more than your soul? Last verse. It says, for the Son of Man will come with his angels in the glory of his Father and will judge all people according to their deeds. Guess what we're looking at in the book of Revelation? We're looking at a final judgment being poured out upon the world, and we're seeing these things right before the second coming of Christ. We know that the unbelievers will stand before a great white throne judgment in everything that they have done, every word, every deed that they've done. You know, it, it, it's, it's all recorded, and they're going to receive a judgment for that. We also know this, that for the Christian, Christian has been, is secure in Christ. Christian has had their sins washed away. You know, we've been justified in Christ, as Paul tells us in the book of Romans. And we stand before what is called the Bema Seat. That is to receive rewards for the things that we have done in this life by faith. And the question comes down to is, are you personally living a life of faith? Because if you're living a life of faith, Paul says that you're going to go through persecution. If you're living a life of faith, Jesus says that, that you're going to lose your life. He didn't say you were going to lose your head. He says you're going to lose your life. And, and, and as we, man, as, it, maybe as, as, as a church, if we can grab hold of a key in all of this stuff, a key of application, that we can understand that the priority of our life is to be built on biblical principles and not passing pleasures. That's it. That's the key. It, it, our lives are built on biblical principles and not passing pleasures. We're making those biblical choices and we're living in step with the Lord, but all of that is happening and all of that is difficult because we live in a hostile world. That the morality that God gives us, his character, who he is, and, and who he's called his church to be, right? Paul says, excuse me, not Paul, but Peter said this in First, first Peter chapter 1, about verse 16, I think is what it is. He says, be holy for I am holy. And that was Peter quoting out of the book of Leviticus, at the very beginning of the Bible, when God was ministering, when God had called out a special people to himself, right, it started with Abram. 
This guy didn't deserve anything that God gave him. I mean, he was a moon worshiper, okay? And, 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 and um, he lived in the area of Ur. It's the place where, where uh, in days of antiquity, they said the hot tub was created. He was living, he was living large, okay? He, he was. He was a 50-year-old guy. And, and, and God called him out of that. He didn't deserve it. But God said, man, I'm going to do something special with you. He has grace. And when God looks upon you in Jesus, he says, I'm going to do something special with you. I'm going to pull you out of this place that you're in lined up against me, walking down this sinful road, and, and that you've got nothing in the present moment but death because you're, you're entrenched with sin, and your end destination is going to be sin. And he ends up taking us from death to life through Christ, saves us, he gives us life, and yet what we see from these tribulation saints, many of these people may very well be people that regularly attended a fellowship, a church. But they didn't take these things for real. They didn't take Jesus' words for real. They, they didn't really understand that, that, well, you know, I'm supposed to live a life of faith. And, and, and maybe there was no faith that was really exercised. But they knew a lot of religious stuff. They knew some procedures. They knew some processes. They knew some Bible verses. They knew that, well, I'm supposed to, you know, put something in the basket every once in a while here. And they knew, they knew, they knew. But they were all just external trappings and not, a, not an internal commitment. Listen, <clears throat> preaching these things to the church, I understand we're studying Revelation. I understand we're looking at the tribulation states. I get that. But preaching these principles, biblical principles to the church, what does it do to us? Those that are in the body of Christ, it excites a passion and excitement within us. Those that are living on the edge, it brings a, hmm. Those that are pushing off and don't want nothing to do with God, it brings this, I'm going to get you, buddy, and send you some fan mail. Okay, I hope you see that, <laughs> the, the different display of responses. Paul said that anybody that desires to live godly is going to suffer persecution. You will experience that animosity around your life because your standard of living comes from Christ, and the culture that surrounds you and I pushes against that. And that's why some days we go through the days, it's like, oh man, this day, I just got beat up from the feet up. I don't understand. Well, because quite frankly, there's a real enemy that is out there. It's a spiritual battle. It's a spiritual war. And, 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 the, and, and for you that are Christians, well, those, the enemy of your soul pushes against you. He tries to wear you out. He tries to tucker you out. He tries to get you into this place to where you get discouraged and frustrated and give up. And, 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 and he tries to overshadow you with depression. He tries to do all of that stuff. Listen, <clears throat> we know the scripture tells us about Satan. That what does he do? He came to kill, to steal, and to destroy. That's it. And I don't know what your personal testimony is. Some of you have heard mine. In, in uh, May 7th, 8 p.m., 1993, I shoved a 9 millimeter Glock 17 in my mouth, and that was it. I was newly married, had a fresh little baby, all of that stuff, and I was ready to kill myself. And was there at that particular moment in a bedroom all alone that God did something great and amazing. It couldn't be attributed to anybody else. I just got mad and I cried out to God. I said, God, if you're real, I need your help now. And I ended up throwing that gun. I'll never forget. Down on my knees. And I took that gun. It was like this. It was my mouth. I bite it down on the end. Very dramatic. And I'll never forget this. That the turning of my hand and what I did is I threw it over into the corner in a bean bag. The gun landed there. And my next step off of my knees with tears coming down my face is I had remembered, God brought to my remembrance, God did this, not Jeff, that somebody had given me a Bible and it was stuffed away in a drawer and I opened up that drawer and I read from Proverbs. I had no idea what I was doing. I didn't know anything. And the only reason I came to Proverbs is because I just kind of opened it up like that in the middle, if that makes sense. And that's, and, and that's it. God took over. And you know, that's some 28 and a half years ago or 28 years ago, 29 years ago. It's been a long time. Whatever the time frame is. And we didn't get very far in this study here. We've only covered two verses, but we're virtually at time. So what would I tell you about the remainder of this chapter? My goodness. Uh, wow. Um, maybe I can high level this here for you, okay? Verses three and four. Let me read them, and then I'll just high level, and, and we'll wrap here in three, four minutes, okay? Um, verse three, it says, and, and, and they were singing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, and here's the song. It says, great and marvelous are your works, O Lord God, the Almighty. Just and kind and true are your ways, O King of the nations. Uh, who will not fear you, Lord, and glorify your name? 
for you alone are holy. All nations will come and worship before you, uh, for, for your righteous deeds have been revealed. Now think about it this way, okay? These guys are, are uh, it says they're singing the song of Moses and a song of the Lamb, okay? Um, it's not really two different songs, it, it, but, but the idea is, is that what Moses has, has put in place in uh, Exodus 15, uh, maybe primarily Deuteronomy 32, because it's more pointed, is, is, is that it's something that points back to the faithfulness of God, and that's it. Now, in this particular song, I'll give you three little things, and they'll throw them up on the screen here for you. Uh, maybe I'll, I'll tell you two, and then I'll give you three things. Uh, two things there to understand about this, the high-level part of this, is that it was prophetic, okay? This psalm from Deuteronomy 32, Moses' song, it's prophetic. Why? Because what it does is it predicts the apostasy of Israel in the future, okay? It, that's what it did. Second thing, fancy word here, okay? It, 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 it's also didactic. What does that mean? Nothing more than this, is, is that it taught the faithfulness of God and the consequences of sin, didactic. So, so the song of Moses from Deuteronomy 32 had two values attached to it. It was prophetic and it was didactic. Again, didactic being that it taught the faithfulness of God and the consequences of sin. Now this song is, is being sung from the tribulation saints as we see it here in Revelation in these verses I just read to you. Three things now come out of this song. The first one is, is that great and marvelous are your works. Okay, so what are they doing? Well, they're praising God for his good work. That's it, that's the very first thing that they're doing from that song. Okay, and in all the Psalms, or songs in this case, Moses, they, they, they mean something, okay? There's something that is attached, and I'm just boiling this stuff down to the skinny, okay? Second thing is this, is that it, it describes praises to God for his ways, and what are his ways? Well, it tells us, verse four, uh, I'm sorry, uh, verse three and a half, just and true are your ways. So it deals with God's work, praising him for that. Deals with, deals with God's ways, praising him for that. And the final thing that, they, that they're praising him for is God's worthiness. How so? Uh, verse four, middle of it, he says, for you alone are holy. All nations will come and worship before you for your righteous deeds have been revealed. That's the picture. That's all it is. And as we walk away here tonight, maybe our final thought is nothing more than this. Just understand this. Please just understand this that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord, period. We have a chance to do that now, but everybody will do it. Everybody will do it. And, and, and that's what Isaiah 45 talks about, and that's what Paul talks about in Romans 14 as well, that, that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. And so, as you close your Bibles, I would just ask, have you done that yet? Have you done that yet? Or is there something that you need to get right with God tonight? Listen, these are, these are, these are really big questions. But they're really questions that, have, that can only be answered by you and you alone. If you're here in the sanctuary or if you're there online, wherever you're at, my encouragement to you before we walk away from tonight, before we close out tonight, is that you would answer that question or those questions, plural, before God. Have I bowed my knee to the Lord now by asking him by faith and receiving his wonderful work of grace? And if I have, amen and awesome. Second question, is there something that's going on in my life where I'm not living by faith? Is, is there something that I can be challenged with because Jesus said, for he who loses his life shall find it, right? If you lose it for his name's sake, you're gonna find it. But if, you're, but if we're living life so consumed on, on my reputation and my way and my schedule and as Jesus who and, 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 and you know, God is kind of taking second burner and we know that within our heart because it's like, mm, he doesn't have to say much more. I've, I've realized where I'm at. I've, I've drifted. I've become, here's the word, lukewarm with the Lord. Mm. Okay, that's a question that I want you to ask and answer in your own heart and deal with it before God. Does that make sense? All right, let us stand together and let us pray.